So, Jan, let's talk about rabies a little bit more. Believe it or not, um, without violating HIPAA, <laughs> We, yes. One of our staff members recently was exposed to rabies. Yeah. I get a call at two in the morning, and uh, it's, uh, I just got bit by a bat, but I'm not sure I got bit by a bat. Should I go to the ER now? <laughs> <laughs> How long does this person have to get treatment for well, their exposure? Like most things, the sooner the better, but you do have time. It doesn't have to be done right away. So if somebody does present, you know, remember, I, like I said, rabies is fatal. So if the indications are there, give the rabies stuff. Yeah. I mean, I don't think this is somewhere to hold back. I would give it. Now, if they're, you know, a week out, I don't know, you know, but the sooner the better, and you do have time. So I still say give it. I think this is yeah. a place so to be generous. So if you think about what this virus does, the way it infects you and the way it gets to your brain is it crawls along your nerves, literally. It literally so if you get bitten in your ankle, it takes longer to get there than if you get bitten on your face. So it, uh, some of it is location driven. That virus actually travels along nerves to get to set up shop in your brain. So, so part of it, if it's like somebody gets bitten on their face, I'm like, come on in, come, let's, just let's just come on in, we'll yeah. take care of that. Well, in this case, our friend uh, stepped on a bat, and uh, so he had weeks, yeah. you know, to come in. <laughs> Although I would still say come on in, just you're, like not two in the morning. Right. Yeah. Come on in. And I wouldn't, I think the mistake is to think, oh, well, it's, I'm, they're too late and I'm not going to give it. But, you know, it's, it's just give late. it. It's never too late. So just a tailspin on that. What do you do if you get bit in the face? Do you give the immunoglobulin still all around the face where the bite is? I mean, what if you have very little room to give that immunoglobulin? Yeah, the guidelines say basically give around as much it. as you can, yeah, like is. around it and in right. it, you know, the best you can, but they I don't recognize know. If, there's if limitations. If I get bit in the face by a bat, distort my face all you need to to put that stuff around there. Yes. Yeah, I'm good with that. Yeah, it doesn't stay that way. Yeah. Okay, let's okay. move on. Hopefully. Okay, frostbite, refer to wound clinic, burn unit, any reason for admission? Uh, this is a good question, this and I think uh, there's, there definitely is nuance to this. Um, a lot of frostbite that's minor can definitely be treated as an outpatient with a wound clinic, et cetera, but there are patients who do need burn clinics. Now, burn clinics, often burn clinics will advertise themselves as burn and frostbite centers. Right. I mean, they actually <laughs> really do take these patients serious because they need the same kind of stuff. They need grafting. They need the same kind of wound care. They may not even be hyperbarics. There's a lot of nuances and some sophistication to treating frostbite. There are some cases where thrombolytics are advise there's a lot of different interesting treatments um, so a burn unit might be required but it may be that you have access to a general surgeon who does this and does debridement and knows how to treat these cases um, certainly indications for admission depend on the extent of the injury and the comorbidities of the patient so somebody who's you know got diabetes and has other reasons to be concerned about how that wound's going to go might be someone that gets admitted it all depends on the scenario there's no black and white answers to it no. I, don't know I do think though that certain areas of the body burn units are probably a good idea to yeah. refer particularly the face Noses and ears are common places for frostbite if you get really get stuck up there. So I guess it's a place where burn units like to sort of be involved. Yeah. Okay, great. And changing avenues here a little bit. This question is, I've had patients ask me how much labs, x-rays are going to cost them because they're worried about the cost. And they've never really been able to answer that question. But Diane, you posted something really interesting in here. Yeah, it's a brand new law. So there was, a, it's called the something tra medical transparency law. A new price transparency It's a rule. federal law that is mandatory for all hospitals in the country to post online easily accessible costs of their services. Um, it went into effect January 1st. A lot of hospitals are dragging their feet, uh, and I get it. It's really hard to kind of gather that information. There's a thing called the, what's it called? That whole list of all the costs. Charge master. Charge master, which is actually, it's a thing. It's a real thing. The charge, it's like, let's go down the charge master and figure out, you know, a portable chest x-ray costs this amount, or the, it's there. It's just a matter of then putting it out. So I, while I was here just looking it up, I looked up UCLA is just out of interest, and theirs is posted basically point by point by point. Each hospital has its own own charge master that's basically been posted online. So you, so find out for your institution, just look up your own hospital and see. They're supposed to all have it out there. Right now it's hospital required. It hasn't trickled down to sort of urgent care kind of areas, but this is this is the point of this is so that you don't get a bill like I just got for like $2,500 for I don't even know what yet. So I've got to track it down. So. Uh, the hospitals really are dragging their feet on this. They're not t particularly interested in, in posting charge masters. They kind of, they play them really close to their chest and now they're asking to lay them out. And it's also extraordinarily complicated to be able to have a, li a, a layman uh, look at charge masters. There was some, a study recently where they had experts go through charge masters and just showed 
just markedly different cha uh, charges between hospitals for the, for the same thing. So it's like, um, yes, you can find it, but le most laymen work aren't going to be able to. Okay. Let's go back to snakes. So why not a tourniquet for a snake bite injury? Wouldn't that slow the toxins from spreading systematically? Yeah, it kind of sounds like a good idea, but it's not recommended anymore. It kind of used to be something that was sort of out there that people would right. do, but now they... like make you do... Anybody have a snake bite kit? I had a snake bite kit. Yeah, where you make like... Make little cuts over the holes and suck out the poison and spit it out and yeah. gets back to your human bite. Now I've just contaminated the wound on top yeah. of everything else. Now they just recommend that you immobilize the extremity and like get them to medical care. So it's just not a good idea. It's My not recommended My favorite anymore. recommendation if you go to like, it's like Wilderness Medicine website or is to just... If, you, if you're bitten by a rattlesnake, Please lie still and stay calm. <laughs> like that's gonna work. Yeah. And hope your GPS works. Like yeah. here's where I am. But you know, snake bites, if you really had an envenomation, they, they start to get swollen. That's what they do. And so by tourniqueting it, you're only making it worse in that case. So um, you know, these can get to look like compartment syndromes. Can, yeah. So you can imagine you wouldn't put a tourniquet on a compartment syndrome. So it just it's not a great idea. Okay. All right, now I actually looked up quite a few things about the BNP increasing or decreasing in high altitude uh, pulmonary edema. But the bottom line for this, Jan, is what? Well, you looked it up, so why don't you give that? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the bottom, the, oh, well, no, because we were sitting next nice to each other and I saw you do it, I saw you well do done. it. So I don't want to well, take your thunder away because you did the work. <laughs> so but the <laughs> truth is that you're not going to have a BNP exactly. when you're diagnosing yeah. CAPE, right? I mean, like, <laughs> it's a really interesting theoretical question, but no. the practicalness no. is that you wouldn't have it's a, a BNP. But Martha looked it up because I didn't know the answer it's to this different question. Path of so there are actually a couple of studies that looked at this, and it's hard to trend this, um, and it's hard to know what time to get a repeat BNP and how it will influence your you care. Um, there's a lot to be said about BNPs in general. Um, but for, for managing... Not all, not all good. But there yes. was a paper saying that there was elevation. Yes, right. there was. Yeah. But, I wonder, so, but, but where's the chicken and where's the egg? Because HAPE is theoretically a capillary leak problem. Right. It's not a cardiac problem. And in fact, HAPE is one of the things that gives you a chest x-ray that looks like raging pulmonary edema with a normal heart size. Right, things like heroin overdoses can do the same. It's one of the, they love questions about that on exams. It's like, oh, normal heart size, lots of pulmonary edema, what's that? So it doesn't make sense that the BNP be up unless there's a, some sort of cycle back where the stress of having that kind of pulmonary edema stresses your heart out rather than where's the chicken and egg. Well, yeah, that's what this uh, article said. This was a 2013 study. BNP <laughs> are increased in HAPE with severe hypoxia and right ventricular overload, but are decreased subsequent to treatment. Well, yeah. so, okay. anyway. I think the harder part is when you're up at altitude working in the clinic and somebody who has a history of congestive heart failure comes in short of breath with what looks like pulmonary edema. That's where the heart size, I think, is helpful. If the heart size is big, it's like, okay, well, we'll try to read it and see. Yeah. Okay. Next question, opinion of treating diverticulitis empirically, like the patient has a history and they're worried, you know, I might get a flare if I do X, Y, and Z. So I think it's totally okay to treat uh, a person who has a history of diverticulitis, presents with the same symptoms that they always get, et cetera. They look okay. Um, that's someone that you can treat empirically. But just beware, you know, keep, again, don't anchor on people's previous diagnoses. Make sure you've thought about other things. You know, but if they do, or if they are really tender or they're not tolerating PO or they have fever, I mean, I just, you know, you don't want to miss a bad case or someone that has complications. But sure, this gets done all the time. So what about just doing things like the low fiber diet, the clear fluids, physical rest, not the antibiotics, but maybe probiotics? So that's an interesting question. And there mm -hmm. have been a few papers looking yeah. at not treating diverticulitis with antibiotics, for sure. And there's been some papers supporting that approach as well. So, you know, this might be something that yeah. we're seeing the pendulum swing, but it is out there, the theory that maybe you don't need antibiotics in all these cases, for sure. So it's a really, really interesting point. I think the point. difference between when I started practicing and now um, so when I started practicing, we had a diagnosis we called painful diverticular disease. People would come in with a history of diverticular disease. They would have usually left lower quadrant pain, sometimes a little tender, but not usually terrible. And we would call it, oh, you know, your diverticulitis is flaring up. You know, don't, don't get, we didn't give antibiotics. We just sent them home. It's like, you're looking great. It's all good to go. That's before we imaged everybody. The problem we have now is we have pictures on everybody. We know what it looks like in there. And now we're kind of backtracking into what we used to do but through, now we have pictures and we're finding a way to do that, what we think is safely, when we did it a lot before. Um, I, I actually like the more informed approach, but it does leave you with a bit of a dilemma. Yeah. Okay. So this question is, can you bill for the use of handheld office ultrasounds? Absolutely, you can bill for anything. So <laughs> that's the short answer. Um, I also put some links on here for the butterfly instructions on how to do this. 
the V-scan instructions on how to do this, and the Sonosite. So they literally will walk you through this. If you really want to start doing this in your clinic or practice, go to a course. They will tell you how to do this, and then you can look at all the billing options for it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, but the bottom line is that you need to be able to provide a report, save the images and the diagnosis, and that Hi allows you to compliant. Yeah, there has to be some infrastructure to yeah. it um, that is required to do billing. And so, you know, often um, groups will hire a consultant or someone to come help them set up that infrastructure. And they have an ultrasound director who's responsible for the QA yeah. and making sure everything's compliant to do the billing with. Yeah. Um, next question. I actually am just going to skip. Well, actually, no, we might as well say it. So the, the question was mammal bites, true penicillin allergy. What's the alternative antibiotic of choice. And this is where, you know, you're, you're always can use your medical applications. Go to your to, apps. <laughs> you know, you, you don't have to spout this off every second, but, but the answer um, was that doxycycline, clindamycin um, are acceptable treatments. And yeah. if they're pregnant and allergic, pop quiz. I saw your answer. Azithromycin, I cheated. Cheater. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I wouldn't have known that, so that, thank you, Martha. You can logic that out. Doxycycline. Yeah. It's like I can logic, true. I can logic my way back to azithromycin. That's like true. I'm the nerd yeah. with all the medical apps and toys over there, so. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Ooh, this was a good one. I like this because we talked about it, too. Yeah. Silvadine, still useful versus bacitracin for burns. Yeah, so silvadine's kind of fallen out of favor, and people don't like it as much as they used to, which is kind of unfortunate because it's cheap and it's sort of everywhere, but silvadine can stain. It has silver in it, and so the colloidal serval, you know, can make these deposits and do some staining, so people, for cosmetic reasons, don't love it. Um, but it's still okay. It's not like it's absolutely contraindicated. It's just not as popular as it used to be, so just know that but it's not like if you use it that it's complete heresy. Um, bacitracin's fine. Like I said, there's a lot of different colloidal dressings that are out there now mm -hmm. that burn specialists like to use. Um, honey is out there too, so I mean there's a lot and of I'll tell you, different for options. a small burn, especially if it's open already, get a tegaderm. Cut a tegaderm to the size of the burn, put it over, it's an occlusive dressing. It basically can keep an eye on it that way. It doesn't, I mean, I don't, when I, when I work, if I burn my, I burn my, I burn myself cooking all the time. I did it the other day. So I'm always going to work with burns. So it works great to cover a burn. Like it. That's a great pearl. Yeah. I like that. Well, oh, there's a question. Yeah, shout it out. Do you use erythromycin ointment on the face? Mm. Yeah, that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Erythromycin ointment on the face. Also a choice, again, silvadine not popular on the face, particularly for the yeah, staining, so um, that's fine. Uh, there's, you know, a lot of these things, just so you know, when it comes to wound management, not a lot of great evidence no. to, t to guide what we do. A lot of it is sort of expert opinion and what people generally do, um, so yeah. All right, the last two questions, Rick, you have to answer in two minutes. It's all you have. First one, <laughs> what about cutting and pasting from a previous chart? I think you sort of covered this. And... Then some questions about, um, I'm currently urgent care based and I have the guidelines changed. Have they changed on billing. emergency billing? So every year, well, every year there's some, uh, you know, twists and little bits, but n n fundamentally nothing right now that I know, uh, know of. I do know that it, in family yeah. medicine, those of you who may be doing some family medicine, they're getting away from this charting thing and allowing some um, much less uh, formal charting, much more, much less rigid charting. Who's they? Uh, CMS. Right. So they got smart. Remember? Protest. Revolution. It works. Uh, unfortunately, emergency medicine was not able to be in that Yet. experiment. And cutting and pasting of your own stuff. Well, I guess you can cut and paste your own stuff. Just don't, but I think if you claim somebody else's, uh, I think that's where the risk is. And I think if you cut and paste, as long as it's, cu as it's current, but it's no longer current, then I think you may, may need to update it. Because just, by, if I, just read what you cut and paste of your own stuff and make sure it still applies. Yeah, the, by default, it's going and to not be current. Diane, you had mentioned maybe putting stuff in italics or in... I put this, that, yeah, oh, Jan did that. Sorry, yeah. Jan. That's okay. We're interchangeable. Yeah. Jan. I, li I think I just mentioned the common practice of if you are cutting and pasting to either change the font or put in italics or change the color of the text that kind of tells you that I cut and pasted that mm -hmm. stuff. Um, a that's practice. a good, it's a good practice to kind of, easy to do. To, it's easy to do, it's not that hard and it helps you designate what's yours and what's cut and pasted. 